Hello and welcome to this lecture on conservation biology. Conservation biology arose in response to bio biodiversity loss. It's a scientific discipline devoted to understanding the factors, forces, and processes that influence the loss, protection, and restoration of biological diversity. Conservation biologists work at multiple levels. For instance, conservation geneticists will study the genetic attributes of organisms to infer their status, the status of their population. And they'll be looking to, to uh, try to define a minimum viable population. That is, how small a population can become before it runs into problems. Conservation biologists try to learn how likely a population is to persist or to go or go extinct, particularly small and isolated populations. Island biogeography theory is a key component of conservation biology. Much of modern conservation biology is based on the equilibrium theory of island biogeography. Protecting habitat and species requires thinking and working at the landscape level. The equilibrium theory of island biogeography explains how species come to be distributed among oceanic islands, but it also applies to habitat islands or patches of one habitat type isolated within a sea of others. The, the theory predicts an island species richness based on the island's size and distance from the mainland. So larger islands that are closer to the mainland will have greater species richness. Smaller islands that are furthest away will have the least species richness. The species area curve shows the uh, results of um, the island biogeography theory as far as the area size area of the island. So essentially large islands contain more species than small islands. For instance, they are easy to, easier to find and their larger populations have lower extinction rates. Secondly, they possess more habitat, so they have more habitat diversity. Take a look at the figure there on the bottom for selected islands. Small islands of habitat rapidly lose species. Habitat fragmentation by roads, logging, agriculture, and urban development occurs when a large contiguous area of habitat is reduced in area and divided into smaller, more scattered and isolated patches, or habitat islands. These habitat islands in, in this fragmentation is a major threat to the long-term survival of many species. So how do we conserve species, what are the right ways to go about it? Well, there are a number of different uh, policies, and one of the most, probably the prominent one in the U.S., is the Endangered Species Act. It's currently the primary legislation for protecting biodiversity in the U.S. Um, it uh, was first signed law in 1973. It's been updated many times since then. And it uh, forbids the government and private citizens from taking actions that destroy endangered species or their habitats. As of 2008, the U.S. had 1,046 species listed as endangered and 307 listed as threatened. Despite opposition, the ESA... Endangered Species Act had, has had some has had success. Uh, for instance, peregrine falcons, brown pelicans, bald eagles, 
and others have recovered and are no longer listed as endangered. Second, intensive management has stabilized other species. There are other versions of these of the ESA. Um, in Canada, they have the Species at Risk Act, which is basically Canada's endangered species law. There are also other ways that uh, to, pr to protect biodiversity. One of them is uh, captive breeding. And in captive breeding, uh, you're going to have individuals are bred and then reintroduced into the wild. These are this is a role for zoos and botanical gardens. Now some reintroductions are controversial. Probably one of the most famous example is the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone National Park, which was strongly opposed by ranchers. Also the second thing is some habitats are so fragmented that even if you captive breed and raise the young and bring them back and, and uh, introduce them, they won't be able to survive because the the habitats won't support them anymore. In conservation, sometimes we see the, th the idea of umbrella species and flagship species. Now, umbrella species act as an umbrella, right? The species serve as an umbrella and they protect uh, whole habitats. So you, oftentimes it's a larger animal that if you protect that animal, let's say the tiger, that will also protect all sorts of other organisms that may be less charismatic but still important. Flagship species are more like uh, the panda bear here, uh, where you use a charismatic species to, uh, to appeal to the public and to spearhead uh, biodiversity conservation. And so uh, probably the most famous example is the World Wildlife Fund's panda bear. There are some international conservation efforts that uh, include widely signed treaties. The first example here is the UN, United Nations Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. It's called CITES, C-I-T-E-S, and it was signed in 1973. And, and this uh, protects endangered species by banning the international transport of their body parts. Second example is the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which was signed in 1992 by the leaders of many nations. It's a treaty outlining the importance of conserving biodiversity, using it sustainably, and fairly distributing its benefits. And it commits the signatory nations to conserving the diversity. And, there's, and by 2008, about almost 200 nations had signed on. Another important idea in conservation biology is, this, is the concept of biodiversity hotspots. These are land areas, uh, terrestrial settings, that support high number of species, especially high numbers of endemic species. So uh, these are areas of, of especially great diversity, and again, particular species that are endemic to the area. That means that they're not found anywhere else in the world. Okay. Uh, the, the, speech, the area must have at least 1,500 endemic plant species, and it must have lost 70% of its habitat due to human impact. So these are both very diverse areas, but also um, under stress from development. Here, there are now 34 global biodiversity hotspots, and those are those, the red areas as shown. Uh, two thirds, or I'm sorry, 2.3 percent of the planet's land surface contains 50 percent of the world's plant species and 42 percent of all terrestrial vertebrate species. So the idea is, uh, these are special places that need our attention if we care about biodiversity. The last idea is the concept of community-based conservation. This is a a growing uh, field, and many conservation biologists 
are actively engaging local people in efforts to protect the land and wildlife in their own backyards in an approach to called community-based conservation. Uh, these are situations in which the projects provide education and retraining and paid salaries to protect animals from poachers. And these are protecting land protects resources, right, from being used up or sold to foreign co corporations. So this community-based conservation is trying to say uh, we can't have, we can't save these areas if we don't find a way for the people there to, uh, to make a living and live sustainably and uh, otherwise all our efforts are for naught. Okay, um, thanks a lot for listening to this uh, lecture on conservation biology. Again, as always, make sure to ask me if you have any questions and uh, thanks again for listening.